Good evening. It is with great pleasure that um, I uh, welcome here this evening at the Fondazione Giorgio Cini an outstanding musician, Esraj and Tarshanai player uh, Kirpal Singh Panesar. Welcome. Thank you so much. Kirpal is a, um, a musician who's based uh, in the United Kingdom, but has uh, been playing for a while extensively across Europe and India. And tomorrow night, he will play at the Fondazione Giorgio Cini, accompanied on tabla by Gurdit Singh Panesar. But this evening, I have this uh, um, exceptional pleasure to um, have a conversation with Kirpal. And uh, um, I hope that in the next um, half an hour or so, we will be able to explore together his music uh, and his instruments. So, um, Kirpal, maybe uh, we would like to break the ice, so to say, talking a little bit about your background as a musician, your experience and your learning um, experiences, please. Okay, indeed. Um, my background in music, um, as a young child, it was actually quite the opposite. I didn't like music at all. It was something um, that even though it was happening all around me, um, you know, the, within the Sikh community, there's always uh, a lot of Kirtan. Uh, so there was very prominent musicians even, but I wasn't interested in learning music at that age. Um, and, but we used to visit India very often and to see our, our Sikh blessings from our Sadhguruji, Sad, Sri Sadhguru Jagjit Singh Ji, um, who themselves were a great musician and very much encouraged every, every child to learn. Um, in, their, in their headquarters in Punjab, in uh, Pani Saib, for the past hundred years, every single person over there has learned music. Um, so we went to visit them and just to seek their blessings, not having in our mind that, you know, that music is going to become such an integral part in our, in our daily lives. Um, and uh, when we paid our respects, Sadhguruji pro uh, asked my father that, you know, do your children learn music, uh, as they would often ask. And my father explained, you know, that I've tried to, to get them to learn, but they're not very keen. Um, and at that stage, then we sought their blessings and with their instruction, uh, I became the student of Ustad Suji Singh Ji, um, who's a disciple of Pandit Ram Narayan Ji, uh, who plays Sarangi. And that's where my musical journey started from. And because of Sadhguruji's blessings, uh, my Guruji's blessings, um, you know, the, the music that I didn't enjoy once upon a time, it became, you know, the center of everything. Uh, I remember finishing school and trying to get home quickly, uh, just so that I could get extra time to practice. Um, and later on, I started learning uh, from Ustad Gurdev Singh Ji, mm. uh, who is a student of Ustad Amjid Ali Khan Sahib. Um, and, uh, you know, they, it, they helped me a lot uh, in my music uh, with Esraj and Dilruba and Tar Shahinai. And as my playing of Tar Shahinai developed uh, Sat with Sadhguru's blessings again, uh, they instructed me to go to Benares and become the disciple of the legendary Shahnai Ustad, uh, Ustad Bismillah Khanji. Mm. Um, and spending time with Khan Saab was such a blessing, such a great experience. Um, and, you know, looking back at the journey that I've uh, so far walked on and the journey ahead, you know, I've got... Uh, so much respect for all of my ustads, uh, especially for Sadhguruji who set me on this journey. I'm very thankful, feel very blessed. And this journey has led me onto this stage here talking to you. So I'm very, very lucky, consider myself very lucky uh, that I'm uh, doing what I am doing and I enjoy doing what I'm doing. Mm. Thank you. So um, I think uh, in this brief, uh, <laughs> outline of your musical upbringing. You've already touched on a, a lot of interesting topics that I would like <laughs> to explore with you. You know, a training that goes in between uh, instrumental music uh, uh, in uh, um, string instruments, uh, but also with Bismillah Khanji, uh, with the uh, Shanai. And uh, the different uh, um, instrument voices uh, that you have been learning, discovering, uh, developing, enhancing uh, with your own style and experience. So maybe we could uh, uh, look at the instruments 
and maybe we can start with the SRAJ. And if you could take us uh, uh, through the instrument to the understanding of the, um, the, the, the organology, the, uh -huh. the, the way the instrument uh, uh, is built and works, uh, and also its developments. Okay. Uh, so most people are very familiar with a sitar, uh, or a guitar at least. Um, and uh, you know, m much like those two instruments, uh, this has a fretboard, which is played uh, with the left hand. The frets are made out of metal. The instrument itself is made out of tonwood, and it has goatskin on the bottom, uh, which is the resonator section. Uh, unlike guitar or sitar, this instrument is played with a bow. Again, it's made from tonwood, and it's horse hair that is used. The strings are metal, um, and when they're played, then it creates a sound like this. So this inst well, these instruments um, were designed in such a way to emulate the sound of human voices singing. Hence, they are used a lot uh, to accompany vocalists. Um, but like I mentioned in my, my musical journey, my, my training started with Ustad Surjit Singhji. Uh, and Ustad Ji um, really drilled me on my basics to get my hand moving fluently, get my bow in the right position. And Ustaji themselves, having a Sarangi background, mm. predominantly, um, you know, the sound of Esraj is very similar to that of a Sarangi. But instead of the, the strings being made out, uh, from gut, uh, this is, these are made out of metal. So it has a slight difference in sound. But nevertheless, it's very similar in terms of the sound projection that is uh, come from Sarangi. Mm. Very clear. Mm -hmm. And similarly to other Indian lutes, uh, for example, the sitar, it has a set of strings that are used for the production of the melody and a set of strings that are um, sympathetic strings. Sympathetic strings that are used for, for resonance. Mm. Um, when they're tuned correctly and played correctly, then uh, they, they vibrate and create a, a warm atmosphere, a warm sound. And can you say a few words about the, the history of the instrument? And yeah, certainly. So in terms of uh, the instrument itself, it's the Esraj is uh, fairly young, you know, within, uh, if you compare it to other instruments, perhaps just uh, 400 to 450 years old. Um, so it's not that old of an in instrument. The um, origin from, of this instrument uh, many say that it's originated in the Punjab, but uh, some, a lot of people say it's from Bengal, from uh, the eastern side of India. Uh, and those are the two regions that it's ma mainly played in. Uh, today you'll find uh, in a lot of Tagore Sangeet um, that uh, this instrument is used, again, to accompany mainly. And within uh, the Sikh Kirtan tradition, you will find these instruments are used uh, extensively um, in both um, the Esraj form and also in the Tarshanai form. Well, so since you introduced the Tarshanai, yeah. uh, maybe we can uh, uh, extend um, to that. So, in, at the start of the 20th century, um, when sound production and recording sound uh, in studios was not uh, done as good as it is today, there was a lot of um, experimentation happening uh, using gramophone technology. So this attachment that I'm adding now, this piece here, I'll just move it towards the camera so you can actually get a better view of it. This piece here is what you find on the gramophone. 
Um, so it's the same thing that it used to have a pin on there and used to put it on uh, with the LP player. Um, so this is exactly that same, same piece. Uh, and this is the horn, uh, which is smaller than the one that you find on, uh, would find normally on a, on a gramophone. But yeah, so this was used on the Asraj to try to actually capture the sound so it would avoid uh, the sound spilling into the other uh, recording equipment that they had. But what they found is when they attached this uh, to the Asraj, uh, it changed the sound into the sound that was very similar to the um, Indian version of the oboe, which is called the Shahenai. Um, because it's played on a string, and the word for string in, um, in Hindi is tar, that's how it got its name, tar shahenai, which basically translates to the stringed shahenai. So I'll just demonstrate this for you. So you can see the sound is very much different to that of the Esraj. Um, and with, with this attachment, the playing style of the Shahenai uh, and uh, the range of sounds that the instrument overall produced was, was increased a lot, uh, which gave the instrument a lot more scope. Um, Shahenai is uh, a, an instrument that it stands out from any other instrument that's being played. So it could be a full orchestra set. Uh, and as a Shahenai starts, you can hear it above. It soars, the voice of it soars above everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and having the ability to create that sound, but at the same time being able to play the Gaiki style, which is the, the vocal style, uh, really gave this instrument you know, its limelight and, and its place. Uh, it was a very famous instrument uh, in the between the 50s and the 80s. But with time, with the advent of new technologies, keyboard um, and other digital recording equipment, the learning of this instrument became, uh, it decreased and the popularity therefore diminished. Um, but again, you know, due to large efforts, especially within the Sikh community with Sadhguruji's blessings, um, this, this, this instrument is now seeing a revival. Uh, I myself uh, teach it within the UK and you know, during the pandemic all across the world on, on Zoom uh, and Skype and things like that. So, uh, you know, I've, I've noticed more and more people I've seen and it's great to see that so many people now want to learn this instrument, mm. um, which, which is very nice. Since you're talking about learning, um, I couldn't help uh, um, thinking, I was trying to figure um, your learning from Bismillah Khan Ji and how you would sit with your Tarshanai while he was, I suppose, playing his own Shanai and you were <laughs> learning his compositions. Uh -huh. So, um, uh, My learning experience with Khan Saab, I mean, just the, the whole experience of becoming their instrument uh, was a very lengthy, pro uh, uh, very lengthy process. Um, but a very, a very great process, uh, you know, that I've learned so much from. Um, Khan Sab, when, when Sadhguruji instructed me to go to them, uh, I went to Banaras and uh, before I met Khan Sab, he said, uh, I'm actually very busy at the moment. Um, so come next time, come again some other time. I, I didn't get to meet them even. Uh, and uh, a few months later, 
uh, Sadhguruji again arranged everything and sent me again to Banaras. So again, caught a flight, I got to Delhi, caught a train, which takes two days to get to Banaras. I again got to Banaras and then Khan Sab said again, you know, I'm not feeling right and something's happened in the family, please come again. And I didn't get to even see them. Even on the third occasion I went, uh, you know, not to sort of repeat the story too much, on the third occasion they sent me back. And on the fourth occasion when I, when I went, uh, they, when I got to Banaras, I found out that Khan Sab is actually on his way to Delhi now. He's uh, about to catch a train. Um, hmm. And I had come by plane that time because I was fed up of going on the train journey all the time. Um, and so we booked a train ticket and just sat in the train and we thought, you know, within the next two days we'll see if we can find Khan Sab on the train. Um, and uh, then just coincidentally, Khan Sab's seat was opposite our seat. So that's where I met my Ustadji for the first time. That's where I paid my respects. That's uh, where he like, decided to accept me as a student. Um, and he then later said, you know, like we, like we check if something's cooked um, mm -hmm. or if it's ready. Uh, you know, this is what we want to see that are you ready to um, like hold on to this uh, impart like the knowledge that I'm going to impart are you ready to accept that and this was it was like a test um, but a test that really I would say tested my patience and tested um, to see you know am I do I really want to am I fit for that mm. purpose and you know with with the blessings of my Guruji's my journey with them started so when I would visit them, I was still studying at that time at school, um, and, and I could only visit them during my summer or Christmas holidays. Um, and they would often sit on their, on their roof, uh, on, on, a, on a bed, and tell me to play. And then themselves, they would lie down. Hmm. Uh, and then after, I used to see that they've perhaps gone to sleep now. I used to, like, after a few, few hours, I used to stop playing, to stretch my arms. and. That's at the same moment they would wake up and say, "Carry on playing, <laughs> you know, uh, as in my my son. Why have you stopped playing? Carry on playing." Um, and then when they see that I've been playing for a long time, just that one instruction that they'd given, then they would sing something, hmm. uh, and they would say, "Now copy this." So I'll just give you an example of uh, like how they would sing. Na na. Na 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 da na. Da na da da da. So there was, um, you know, it was very fun for me. Uh, Khan Sa would say something, they would say, play it. Um, and then I would try and they would say, no, do it again. Uh, and, and then I had to spot what, what I was doing or what I wasn't doing that he was telling me to do. And that, that process of listening, refining, trying again, finding where the fault is, doing it again, it was such a great experience for me. Um. I think this was a concentrate of uh, a set of beautiful anecdotes uh, that talk about, you know, uh, the value of commitment, uh, the value of dedication to one's own guru, and uh, the, the, also the, the value, though, of uh, ongoing dedication. But talking, uh, going back to the topic that we were talking about, you really, in the last example, you brought together really the idea of uh, the, the voice yeah. uh, and also the playing of the Tarshanai in a Gayaki style, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I was wondering whether um, you could tell us more now something a bit more personal, because again, you come from these two, um, these two streams of uh, learning, which, however, they're not separate because mm. in Indian music there is always a prominent uh, position which is given to the aesthetics of the voice, the, or the human voice as well. So these two strands uh, are not um, separate aesthetically, they, they, they converge anyway. But I was wondering if you could tell us about how you as a musician have uh, created your own voice uh, in between the the Tarshanai and the Esraj. Yeah, uh, so like, like you've uh, very eloquently put, 
Um, there is so many different styles within a style. Um, and being so fortunate to learn from different ustads who all played different instruments. Um, I was able to pick up certain techniques from each ustad and then join them together. Um, ustad Gurdev Singh Ji was, uh, and he is a great Dilruba uh, exponent today, but because his background is in Sarod, mm. um, he's a great exponent of the Sarod, a lot of his compositions were Sarod Ang, or we can call them Tantrakari Ang. Mm. Um, so the, the rich background of having, uh, being able to play an instrument in that fashion, so like a plucked instrument, and then also combining it with the gaiki and able to actually sing through my instrument, I'm able to demonstrate both of those. So when I perform, there is so there's such a, a rich uh, palette to choose from, really. You know, so sometimes I can go towards the tantrakari yang, you know. So so his uh, like a sarod style of playing, uh, which would be uh, something like. So using, again, you know, so from different techniques, learn from different gurus, I'm able to pick and choose or go in and out of different styles within when I'm, when I'm performing. So can I um, prod you a little bit further on this? <laughs> and again, uh, I think the one going to ask you is something that is incredibly personal because I think it's really about the way that you relate to music. You have this palette, as you said, it's quite wide and there's a lot of color there, different techniques, different styles. When you, when you play a raga, so do you think that maybe some rags are more suited to a particular style? And again, I don't think it's a theory, this is really your feeling, mm -hmm. or do you think they, that is... So uh, a rag, you know, uh, and I often say this, it's, it's not just a scale. Mm. A rag has its own personality. Mm. To get to know that personality, one lifetime is not enough. Mm. Um, there, one of the first rags I learned was rag Yemen. Mm. Um, I still feel a great joy when I play that rag. Uh, and it still takes me into places I've never been to before. Mm. Um, there are some rags that I would say are more popular uh, and hence played more. Um, but there's no one rag that I can say, you know, this is the one that I like. Um, at the same time, as saying that, um, you know, it, uh, if, if there's something, if there's a flavor that you're enjoying, you kind of, you know, when do you stop? In, like it's, it's, it's one of those things with all musicians, if, if they're doing something, it's, you know, it's very hard to stop them. Um, you know, the, and uh, you would carry on exploring that until that flavor, you know, doesn't diminish. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's very hard to choose a rag. I think the rag chooses you. 
Uh, and uh, once you start exploring it, the possibilities are endless. Even though there are boundaries in a rug, but the possibilities are infinite. So you like um, using the different techniques uh, and styles that you've learned? Uh, yeah, yeah, to, to explore further within the rag. Um, there's, there's so many possibilities in between two notes. How you approach one note from the previous note, and there's so many different ways of doing that. And with techniques of the different styles, there is so many, uh, so many different possibilities of uh, approaching those notes. Uh, so, you know, you end up going deeper and deeper each time. And do you think that, um, for example, a composition, the way you've learned, uh, uh, makes you feel, I wouldn't say constrained, but uh, more bound to certain styles? So, for example, if you learn a vocal composition or when you render um, a composition, uh, for example, one by Bismillah Khanji, and you render it on Tash and I, and how do you feel about presenting it in a different style, maybe on the S Raj? Um, yeah, again, you know, so there's two ways of learning. There's the way of learning through repetition, you know, so as your Guruji is teaching you, the first stage is to learn it as they are, mm. um, as they're instructing. So you end up playing the exact same phrases but you can never say those phrases like your Guruji because he's got his own personality. It's his own uh, coordination with his hands and his own emotions that he's outpouring. You're telling the same story, but you're telling it in your way now. So the, f the, the framework is very similar, but how you tell that story is all based on your experiences. But those experiences are, again, you know, so they're, they're influenced with with your ustajis, with the times you spent, uh, for example, anything that, you know, that when I'm doing kirtan, when I'm playing um, a, a composition of Sadhguruji's, I imagine, you know, the way that they were singing it. And I can remember the expressions they had on their, on their face when they were singing it. So I try, to, I try to play it that way. I can never do it like they did. But I try to do it um, thinking that this is what the expression would be. And, you know, that journey in itself, you know, just imagining that my playing, my guru is happy, you know, because he, he used to be happy when he used to be singing this. That, that, that you know, that journey of constantly trying to re-invoke those memories, re-invoke those lessons, uh, and trying to, you know, please your own ustads, and searching yourself within, within that music, um, you know, is, is what I try to, what, what I try to do. Um, you said it's very personal, and it is very personal. Um, but I, th I think most musicians, um, especially those musicians who followed this Guru Shish Parampara, this uh, student-teacher uh, uh, relation, um, they will ultimately try to seek this same, uh, same way of uh, trying to get through their music. I, I find all this uh, very fascinating. I think one, one topic that comes up here and which I think add, adds layers of complexity to the issue of identity, uh -huh. because we talked about the voice of the instrument. So we have a, a, a timbre. You bring a voice out of the instrument, but at the same time, there is the identity of your own musical voice. There is the voice of your ustad, mm -hmm. but there is also the raga. Yeah. Because you, you, I'm thinking now more about tomorrow's um, concert, for example. I'm thinking about the people who are going to come and see you on stage. Uh, and one, one thing that you express very clearly is that uh, it's the raga that, that chooses you. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on that, please? Yeah, so a, a lot of our rags are time-based, so they're based around different times of the day. They're also set to different seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's different rags for the monsoon, different rag for uh, when it's hot, different rag when it's cold like now. Um, <laughs> and there's also, you know, different rags for, um, you know, for, for occasions and for moods, you know, in general, your mood, if you're happy, sad, um, or, uh, you know, you want uh, an energizing rag, so to speak. Um, so when you sit down, you kind of have to be in a, in a neutral state of mind and try to search what is happening inside you at that time. How are you feeling right now? Um, and then based on, the, on, on your mood, try to think what rag matches this mood. 
Uh, and that's, that's what I'm trying to get at when I'm saying the rag chooses you. Um, and then once you've selected that rag, you, 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 you sort of dive in as deep as you can. Hmm. Uh, it's not about getting to the other side, it's about how far you can drown in within that. Hmm. <laughs> Very beautiful image. <laughs> it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite, yes, quite striking. And the compositions come in the same way. Yeah, they come in the same way. I mean, compositions are very important, um, but whichever one you choose, there are so many. I mean, with, within Indian classical music, there are three things that are paramount, which are sur, tal, and le. Sur being staying within the note, uh, within key. Uh, le being staying within tempo. And tal is the rhythmic cycle that you choose. Mm. Um, and so a composition usually has an otan, a starting point, uh, and then it has the downbeat, the, the sum. Uh, how you go about you know, uh, improvising and then finding that, uh, the otan again, the starting point again, uh, is you know, a great chapter within, within everything that we do within Indian classical music. Yeah. So uh, there's so much to do. There's the tal side, there's the la side, there's so many tempos within a set, a set tempo. Um, you know, so you can go double speed, quadruple speed, um, and then you can find the, 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 the speeds in between those as well. The one and a half times the speed, the five times the speed, and the two and a half times the speed. Uh, and, you know, you can, the, in, the, again, the possibilities are infinite. It's just how much you want to explore, um, you know, with that. If I may diverge slightly, um, very often, we, we tend to talk quite a lot about the identity of a rag, uh, the emotion, the mood, uh, and uh, the, the variety of the, these moods. Uh, um, and I got the feeling that sometimes people tend to less talk a bit less uh, about how the rhythmic side affects or is related to these moods. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could expand on that. So how does Tal? Mm -hmm. uh, influence or contributes, I would say, uh, in the expression of that mood uh, and how you feel it also relates to the nature of your instrument. Yeah. Um, in if you, most concerts that you attend, you'd see that in the beginning, it's just expression. We, we go through a lap. Mm. Um, there's, no, there's no tempo. There's no beat, no rhythm. Um, after the exploration has ended, um, then comes the introduction of um, a, a rhythm. Um, and that's usually done in the form of jor. So it's the same exploration, but this time done with the tempo. So a tempo will be very slow, uh, and you'll start playing sa ni ni re sa ma da ni sa ni re re sa ni da ni ma da ni da sa ni da ni re da ni sa ni ni re sa so again this is just the introduction of a rhythm and slowly that rhythm um gradually increases and with that, the, your movements of your hands and the movements, the intricacy that you can start creating, um, you know, um, will, the pace changes. So your rhythm, with the increase of the rhythm, the patterns become more complicated. 
and then when this exploration finishes then becomes uh, then comes the rhythmic cycle so the introduction of mm. tal um and you know so there's so many different tals um just one that you know is is very i would say common uh, is teen tal which mm. is a 16 beat rhythmic cycle uh, so you know so within this rhythmic cycle now your exploration is bound with that within mm. that cycle and the ability of like um, going on a tangent exploring away from the the composition and then seamlessly coming back into mm. that composition is what what becomes the topic mm. um and then how i mean with 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 having uh, that tal is usually obviously a, a tabla or percussionist mm. um and then how you can exchange um those little intri- uh, intricate ornamentations of the in the music with each other is mm. what that with, with the exploration is done together then rather than just done on your own uh so yeah and this this you know this keeps on going uh, um and i could i could demo all of this right now but i think we should save it for tomorrow absolutely <laughs> May I ask another question since uh, I'm still struck by the image of you said when you play a rag is no a matter of going to the other side is a matter of you know drowning <laughs> diving in and uh, um of course uh, we've talked about you know you sit there with the instruments uh, the raga um, you you select the raga you dive into it but also in terms of the context uh, what what are the ingredients let's say what facilitates what makes um the right environment for you to really dive in see i think with with any music when we listen to something just like um smells i think as well you know you're able to uh, to attach a memory to it or attach an emotion to it so when i think about my emotive uh, my, my emotional state of being at that time uh, and then i kind of try to think okay when i listen to that piece of music this is how i felt um that's that's what i would say i mean everyone feels different um mm. you know you can say that this rag is a happy rag or a, a sad rag or uplifting but it's how that person perceives it how it felt to that person um and so the, in their expression of playing uh you know that's where that where the personality of that rag comes out um and they're able to explore it in in their own way so a rag like bhairav um sa re ga ma re re sa ni sa da re sa if i had to explain the mood for this i would say you know it's like uh someone had been waiting for their beloved to return and had been waiting all night and as the sun is about to rise that person is looking around at everyone else who's fast asleep but that one person is feeling worried and feeling forlorn and there's a longing to meet or unite with their beloved and you know when that person speaks the voice or the sound that it makes is rag bhairav mm. um so you know there's so many different ways and so many different rags that portray different moods but i guess you know it's the picture that you see or the way you feel when you heard that rag um so that that's what i can think of <laughs> may i ask you a little bit more about this image um <laughs> <laughs> since you were giving this beautiful uh, uh, example the, the vocal yeah. example so this image uh, is uh this idea of the you know the separation the longing and um is it more the movement the 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 challenge of the raga or is it more a particular swara particular um... so i think both of those things uh like um you can say play hand in hand uh the challenge yes you know so you can't be longing to see someone and you know having fast movements you can but you know that's not how i see it um but at the same time the you know the combination of rag uh, of the notes ga ma dha da pa ga ma re re sa so the, the way that the notes come together 
you know, the, the sort of relationship that they have with each other um, is, you know, I think, you know, if we always say that music is the universal language. If nobody knew the words I was singing, they will be able to feel what I'm feeling mm. um, by listening to those notes. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, as well as the challenge, like you said, the, or the way or the sort of tempo that you choose. Hmm. And there was this mean that this that it was a particularly yeah. you emphasized quite a lot in yeah. your example. Uh -huh. yes. So those techniques again, you know, so hearing that and then you know replicating that on on your instrument. So that's what we try to do. Um, and even if you, when, when you're thinking about a rag, you find that there's music in, in the silence even, in between the notes. Um, because it's all about the journey that you're going on, that expression, um, or that you know, you're, you're actually telling your story, your state of mind, you're, t you're sharing that. And Whilst you're sharing it, it's some, very often, and I, I guess I, I realize this, especially through the pandemic, it's the first time your own ears are hearing that because you know you, the conversations that go on your mind, you don't actually hear them. You are a witness to them. But when you're playing your music, it's the first time your ears hear what you're actually feeling. Mm. And you hear yourself you know, projecting your emotions out, um, which is you know, a great, grateful, well-being state of mind. So um, we are really looking forward to tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, we will see which uh, rug um, you will select. Uh, may I ask one question about the concert setting? Uh -huh. So um, I know that musicians have different approaches to um, a public or a concert, a performance with an audience. Uh, um, for you, when you are performing, uh, um, how much you are um, in different moments, maybe of the performance, how much are you um, checking, let's say, so to say, to the, the mood of there. the room? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll check, I'll check in the beginning. But um, I would say, you know, especially at the beginning of a, of a piece, like I mentioned, when once you've chosen what you're playing, then it's all about diving in. I'm very in a concentrate, uh, mood at that uh, at that stage, so m very often I would close my eyes and try to zone away from everything else and just imagine that I'm sitting, you know, in where my in my space, and then I'll try to find you know myself from there. And as as the mood changes slightly, yes, I will, uh, you know, I will, you know, and it depends what what the what the audience is like. Sometimes. Uh, and this happens, you know, in different different environments. Sometimes the audience are in total silence, mm. and there's uh, that's an amazing feeling in itself. But sometimes the audience is very, uh, you know, um, they they're able to, you know, say or portray their own emotions, their own feelings. Uh, in India, very, you know, very very often, someone will say "va." When there's nothing else to say, you know, the, the, or a way of appreciating, they will say va, and you know, and that uh, again, you know, that sort of audience, there's different vibes that you get from that, um, and that all changes the dynamic of your performance and how you play. Uh, ultimately, though, I think it's it's you know what what you do. Um, at, at, whilst I'm singing in my in my living room at home, the music that I'm playing there is what has got me onto the stage. Uh, mm. And that's how, you know, um, someone, someone hears you're playing and said, oh, if you can do that on the stage and everyone else can hear you, I can't fit 250 or 300 people in my living room, unfortunately. So, you know, so that's why we end up in a, in a, in a place like, like here, a beautiful place like here. And of course, so when you're on stage, you go your accompanist with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm very, very fortunate, you know, that uh, I've got to share the stage with some amazing tabla players. But for me, my, my elder brother um, is someone who I've always admired uh, and looked up to. And just like, you know, when, when, the, when your Bluetooth is on, 
Um, you know, the connection is very strong. I don't need to say or I don't need to, you know, signal that can you increase or decrease. I think there's a, a great synchronization, and that's that's since birth. Uh, so I'm very lucky that uh, and honored that he's uh, traveled with me and uh, will be accompanying uh, me on the stage. So we will be looking forward to seeing you tomorrow <laughs> uh, together with Gurdit on Tabla. Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we could go on for much yeah. longer. But I think we stop here and we resume tomorrow in the form of music. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks.